Blackpool has been a popular destination since the mid-18th century. Initially, people went to the town to enjoy the health benefits of bathing in the sea. However, by the late 19th century, Blackpool had become known for its lively and exciting atmosphere. The town's golden sandy beaches were filled with families enjoying their leisure time, with parents lounging in deck chairs and children delighting in donkey rides. However, with the rising popularity of overseas trips during this time, Blackpool's appeal gradually waned, with people wanting guaranteed sun along with the sand. However, like many other places, it had its dark side. The popularity of the area attracted individuals with darker intentions. Louisa Merrifield would become one of those undesirables. She was born in Wigan, Lancashire in 1906 as Louisa May Highway. Out of 12 children, she was one of the seven who survived. Due to their lack of wealth and the large number of mouths to feed, the struggling family had no option. When the children were older, they sent them out to find work in order to help provide for the family. It is believed that as Louisa got older, this would drive her to pursue money by any means necessary in order to avoid the same difficult life her parents had faced. Moreover, once she discovered an effortless way to acquire wealth, she would strive for even more. She had started her younger days earning money by doing little things like babysitting and helping people with disadvantages. As she grew older, she trained and obtained a nursing qualification. In the early 1930s, she married Joseph Ellison, who worked in the iron industry, and had six children with him, losing two in infancy. By the 1940s, the world was in a state of upheaval, and crime was rife. It was the era of the blackout killer, Hay and Heath. Nobody felt safe. Money, food, and other everyday items were short. Many people relied on the black market to obtain food and other necessary items illegally. But it also provided opportunities for people to make money at the expense of others in need. At the end of the war in 1946, Louisa committed ration book fraud. It is possible that she was caught for one of the fraudulent claims for new ration books, as at least 90% of the claims were found to be fraudulent. But, whatever, Louisa found herself in court and sentenced to 18 months because she refused to pay the £10 fine. It's been said she might have been committing other minor offences before this, but it can't be proven. Due to her sentence, her four children were taken into care. Joseph Ellison passed away in 1949 from hepatitis at the age of 44, and Louisa began straight away to look for another husband. Within a few months, on the 6th of February 1950, she met and married 78-year-old Richard Weston, who was 30 years older than her. But after 10 weeks of marriage, he died from a heart attack. Throughout her search for a potential husband, Louisa was no longer nursing in the hospitals for whatever reason, and instead took up the role of a personal home caregiver, cleaner housekeeper, for the elderly and vulnerable individuals. However, her duties mainly revolved around housekeeping and cleaning tasks. Unfortunately, Louisa's performance in this field was far from satisfactory. She was not only incompetent at her job, but also faced allegations of theft and displayed a generally negative attitude. As a result, she was let go from all of her positions. Louisa was a heavy drinker and enjoyed the camaraderie in the local pubs, but the alcohol made her attitude worse. Her morning, it would seem, was short as her third husband was just around the corner. And I might say it was a match made in heaven, the perfect match. On the 27th of August 1950, she married her third husband, 68-year-old widower Alfred Edward Merrifield, a feeble-minded man whose previous marriage showed his lack of decency towards his own children when he abandoned his ten children in 1928, leaving his wife struggling to feed and clothe the family. 
It would seem the newly married couple wanted a fresh start and decided they would like to live by the sea. So they packed their trunk and ventured off to a new life in Blackpool. Not being able to retire due to monetary reasons, Louisa took on some small jobs, but she couldn't find the one job that she could stick with, or should we say, would put up with her. Her attitude towards her employers was abysmal and it showed in her lack of work ethics. But housekeeping was an opportunity. It gave her access to people's homes where she could steal items of some worth and even take money when the opportunity afforded it. Once she was discovered, she simply moved on, with most of the victims of her crimes just wanted to be rid of her, without the fuss of the police. In 1953, Louisa read in the local paper that a lady was looking for a living companion and housekeeper. 79-year-old widow Sarah Ann Ricketts, a small, delicate-looking woman, lived in a modest but pretty little bungalow at 339 Devonshire Road in Blackpool, a very respectable area. After their interview with Mrs Ricketts, the couple were employed as housekeeper, handyman and living companions. Now Mrs Ricketts was a widow whose two husbands had both taken their own lives by gassing themselves in the kitchen, which in itself was thought odd at the time, and it would seem the delicate looking old lady had a short fuse of her own and wasn't shy to give as good as she got. She was a difficult woman and hard to please. Louisa began her job taking care of Sarah and possibly weighing her up, finding out her weaknesses. Over a short time, she knew that Sarah Ricketts was just as formidable as she. But Louisa could play the game and was patient. She learned that Mrs Ricketts had changed her will on a couple of occasions. She learned that Sarah didn't have many friends. She had daughters, but they weren't that close. The old lady had money. The bungalow alone was worth quite a lot of money and an idea popped into Louisa's head. In March, after just four weeks, the bungalow had been signed over to Louisa by Mrs Ricketts, with Louisa having a doctor, Dr Yule, state after an examination that Mrs Ricketts was of sound mind to sign legal documents. Whatever happened in those four weeks must have been quite remarkable, but cracks had begun to show in the relationship between the two women. And some days later, Sarah Ricketts decided to add Alfred's name to the will for the bungalow to be left to both he and his wife, leaving Louisa seething. For the first few weeks, Louisa and Sarah shared the cooking, but after a disagreement, Sarah decided to make her own meals, which were mainly jars of jam. Sarah Ricketts enjoyed most things sweet. She definitely had a sweet tooth, as Louisa learned and one of her favourites was the jam. As a desperate Louisa saw this as an opportunity, knowing the bungalow could be taken away from her at any time, as the two women were now at loggerheads, and Sarah had complained that the couple spent too much time in the pub when they were being paid to look after her, and Sarah, being the difficult woman she could, could change her mind at any moment and take Louisa's name off the will. It wasn't proven that Alfred knew what his wife was up to, but he became a middleman as the atmosphere changed between the two strong-willed women. Plans were being plotted, but a drunk Louisa made a critical mistake one night at the pub. On April the 12th, she revealed to her friend, Jessie Brewer, that she planned to return home and prepare the deceased old lady for burial. When asked about the timing of the lady's passing, Louisa admitted that the lady was not dead yet. Louisa opted for the easiest and most popular choice of the time, a readily available poison that caused a cruel and painful slow death. The rat poison, Rodin. Louisa wanted it to look like the old lady was declining in health, so she called the doctor out on the 13th of April, when Mrs Ricketts seemed a little unwell. The doctor, who was Dr Yule's partner, Dr Albert Woods, was puzzled and slightly annoyed as he wondered why Louisa had summoned him for such a minor ailment as bronchitis. 
Little did he realise that this was all part of her plan. By calling the doctor, Louisa aimed to create the appearance that Mrs Ricketts was already in poor health, thereby avoiding any suspicion. Louisa carried out her plan and mixed the poison into Mrs Ricketts' favourite food, jam. Sarah Ricketts did enjoy her jam and she ate it happily. It was thought the dose she was given must have been quite large for it to take effect so quickly. The effects it would have had on her is quite horrendous, with agonising stomach pain, internal bleeding, shortness of breath and vomiting. Mrs Sarah Ricketts died the next night, the 14th of April, but Louisa didn't call the doctor until the next day, claiming she didn't think the doctor would appreciate her calling him out at such a late hour. When Dr Yule visited Sarah Ricketts on her death, he was immediately suspicious, especially as his partner Dr Woods had recently visited her and she only had a mild case of bronchitis. He also remembered he had had a conversation recently with the housekeeper Mrs Merrifield regarding Mrs Ricketts being of sound mind to change her will. He put his concerns forward and suggested a post-mortem would be required before he would sign the death certificate. The post-mortem carried out by Dr George Bernard Manning found bran and yellow phosphorus in the stomach and concluded the widow had died of phosphorus poisoning from the rat poison rhodine. Chemist Alan Thomas analysed the stomach contents and found 0.042 grains of free phosphorus and a further 0.099 grains in the intestines. There were no signs of any solid food in her stomach. Rhodine was confirmed as a poison that could easily be bought in any chemist without having to sign the poison record book. The pathologist gave the information to the police. An investigation was immediately started. The police called on the Merrifields and informed them what had caused Mrs Ricketts' death. Louisa said she was shocked to hear that as there was nothing in the house that could harm anyone and that Mrs Ricketts had been living mainly off alcohol when they moved in. Then she claimed that she took over the food shop and stopped Mrs Ricketts from drinking so much, which was another complaint Mrs Ricketts had had about the Merrifields' lack of food. Both the Merrifields claimed they had not given anything to Sarah Ricketts and knew nothing of rat poison. The home was searched throughout but nothing was found. Bizarrely at this time, the Merrifields had requested the Salvation Army to play Abide With Me outside the house. Merrifield frequently spoke with the press, who was stationed outside the bungalow, witnessing the continuous flow of police activity. Her face was prominently featured in the newspapers. She expressed her distress, particularly considering the efforts she and her husband had made to fulfil their duties for their employer. Scotland Yard became involved and went on to question all the chemists in the town and eventually they came across the one that had sold the Rodine to Alfred Merrifield. When the news of Mrs Ricketts death came out a concerned Mrs Jessie Brewer recalled what Louisa had said the other night in the pub and called the police. Merrifield and her husband were arrested on suspicion of murder and in July 1953 went on trial at the Manchester Assizes. Miss Brewer gave her evidence, saying her friend had told her, We are landed. We went to live with an old lady and she died, and she's left me a bungalow worth £4,000. It was all left to me until that old bugger got talking to her, and then it was left to us both jointly. I made everything all right. It cost me £2 to get a doctor to prove she was in her right mind. Another witness, Elizabeth Barraclough, testified that while waiting in a bus queue, Louisa, a complete stranger, had told her that she was very worried because she was looking after an old lady who was very ill, and after returning the previous day, had found her husband in bed with the old lady and was messing about with her, and this had got her vexed. If this goes on again, I'll poison the old bugger and him as well. She's leaving me the bungalow between me and my husband, but he's so greedy he wants it all on his own. The Merrifields testified for themselves and stuck to their story that they knew nothing of the rat poison. 
They were also caught out on a number of lies. It was proven Louise arranged for the doctor to visit. She arranged for the will to be changed. Just 11 days after she took the job, she arranged for a quick cremation so Mrs Ricketts' daughters didn't find out. She went on to make lurid and strange accusations in court, saying that Mrs Ricketts had had some kind of relationship with her husband and gave some explicit details. Alfred, it was claimed, had prevented Mrs Ricketts from contacting the solicitor when she wanted to talk with him. He had bought the poison and had blocked the kitchen door when the doctor visited. Then a shocking witness for the defence came to the dock. Professor Jim Webster, the director of the Home Office Forensic Laboratory in Birmingham, gave witness for the defence, stating that it was of his opinion that Mrs Ricketts had died a natural death from necrosis of the liver just after the phosphorus had been administered. Thus it was the contention of the defence that the prosecution had not satisfactorily proven that Mrs Ricketts had even been murdered, let alone that the two defendants were guilty. Even if Mrs Ricketts had died from ingesting rhodine, it could just have easily been by suicide or accident. With regard to Mrs Ricketts will, Mr Nahum told the jury that Mr Merrifield had believed that Mrs Ricketts was amending it in his favour, thus he had no motive for murdering his employer. Nahum also dismissed as ridiculous the idea that Louisa had murdered Mrs Ricketts because she had caught her employer and her husband engaged in sexual practices together. He reminded the jury that the police had found absolutely no trace of Rodine on the premises at Devonshire Road. After the judge summed up the case, the jury took just six hours before returning with a guilty verdict for Louisa Merrifield, but they couldn't agree on a verdict for Alfred. Alfred was described as confused, dim-witted, a man wandering, even as a simpleton by the judge. Despite the part he played in the murder and despite his shady past, he was released. Louisa was sentenced to death. Although Alfred had not been the one to put the poison in the jam, he was widely believed to be an accessory. A new trial was called for him, but by August his case was dropped. An appeal for Louisa was applied for but dismissed. On the 18th of September 1953, 46-year-old Louisa May Merrifield was hanged by Albert Pierpoint at Strangeways Prison. Alfred was no fool, in my opinion. He managed to live in the bungalow for a couple of years, but after a legal battle with Mrs Ricketts' daughters, Alfred would receive one-sixth of Mrs Ricketts' estate when the property was sold in 1956. He made more money giving away his wife's clothes to the Blackpool Chamber of Horror, who had a waxwork made of him and his wife, and continued to profit from the case on the beach front by talking to those that wanted to know all about Louisa Merrifield, the Blackpool Poisoner. Before he died in 1962, aged 80, he spoke to a crime writer that Louisa, the old bugger, would have poisoned him too if she hadn't been caught. Frederick Rothwell Holt Frederick Rothwell Holt was born in 1887 in the Fairhaven area of Blackpool. Back then in 1887 the British colonies gave young educated men the chance to see the world by taking up positions as civil servants, ambassadors, clerks or British representatives. The world was undergoing a transformative period, with young Frederick poised to play a role in this change. Although details about Frederick's childhood are scarce, and believe me they are, by 1914 he had become a lieutenant in the British Expeditionary Force, deployed to France and Belgium. He courageously fought against the German forces on the Western Front. Some guesswork was done to discover, if possible, some of his earlier life from the information we already had on him. It's thought that to have reached the rank he was now at, he must have had an extraordinary military career starting at the age of 16 in 1903. 
but it's thought more likely that he came from money, so joined in 1914 at the age of 27 as a lieutenant, which was nothing unusual back then. Any man aged 18 or over with a private school education was deemed officer material and trained to lead men. Fred went to war with the 4th Loyal North Lancashire Regiment as a serving lieutenant at the age of 27. When war was declared on the 4th of August 1914, the 4th were hurriedly recalled from Kirkby Lonsdale and took up their quarters in the public hall, Preston. Within two or three days they had recruited to strength in all ranks and had volunteered practically to a man for service abroad. Frederick's life was on the brink of a drastic transformation. He experienced relentless bombardment from trench mortars while standing in the damp trenches, fully aware that he would soon be sent into battle once again, charging over the top. Something inside Frederick snapped, leaving him trembling and unable to move as he was consumed by profound fear. The sound of the gun blasts had a devastating effect on him, repeatedly jolting his already frayed nervous system. It was as if his ability to think clearly had been completely compromised. It was in the First World War that the psychological trauma of warfare was formally recognised by doctors and society, with the condition becoming known as shell shock. As a rule, obvious shell shock cases were removed from the front line. Depending on the severity of their condition, they would either be given work behind the lines or hospitalised and often returned home. By quickly dismissing those afflicted with it, as they were concerned that these soldiers might display erratic and unpredictable behaviour, putting others in danger. So around 1917, Fred was sent home to Lancashire. It wasn't a bad life to return to, coming from a wealthy family living off a decent inheritance. While at the Blackpool Hydro, where he was being treated for his injuries, he met 24-year-old Kathleen Kitty Brakes, who was visiting with a group of friends. Kitty was originally from Yorkshire and had married at the age of 18 to James Studdard Brakes. The couple were having problems, so Kitty separated from her husband and moved back with her parents to the Rycroft Farm in Sheffield, a busy household of six sisters and a brother. Whatever occurred between Fred and Kitty, we can but guess, but it would seem they kept in touch. Kitty found work in Bradford for a music store, but the blossoming relationship between the two moved forward and eventually they began an affair. It's believed Kitty travelled to Blackpool to see Fred while she stayed working in Bradford. It's also thought the affair was kept secret, which wouldn't be surprising. Sometime in November 1919, Kitty took out a life insurance on herself, worth around £5,000, with 32-year-old Frederick Rothwell Holt as the beneficiary. Furthermore, she had modified her will to bequeath her beloved wedding ring to Fred. They may have been happy. It was Christmas and it would seem Kitty was looking forward to seeing Fred. She told her family and friends she was going on a short break to Blackpool and on Tuesday the 23rd of December she was seen leaving her work at the music store. Investigations revealed a receipt showed that she had booked into the Palatine Hotel on the 23rd and it was learnt that after dining she asked a waitress for directions to Lytham. It's not known what happened from that moment on but on the morning of Christmas Eve 1919 Edward Gillett was out walking in the sand hills between St Anne's and Blackpool and discovered the body of an attractive, well-dressed young woman, who appeared to have been shot. He called the police and two officers were dispatched to the scene. According to the news report at the time, the body of a well-dressed lady with a wound in her forehead was found on the beach. She had a large amount of cash on her, as well as a black bank book. Her face and head, which had suffered three wounds, was covered in blood and her body and leg were similarly covered in cuts caused by, as the police put it, a sharp instrument. 
As the lady had her bank book still in her possession, it enabled the police to identify her as 25-year-old Kathleen Elsie Brakes. Kitty was still wearing several items of jewellery and she still had a lot of cash scattered around her, which led the police to conclude robbery was not the motive for the crime. A surgeon attended the body and reported that the wounds were not self-inflicted. The hotel receipt and the letter was found in her belongings. The investigating officer, Detective Inspector John Sherlock, was the arresting officer who quickly learned within hours of discovering the body that Kathleen had been involved in an affair with Frederick Holt, a 32-year-old man. This information was gathered from both her family and letters found in her possession, revealing that the affair had been ongoing for over a year. He was a man of independent means and a member of a respectable family from nearby Ansdell. There was some important information in the letters. They found Fred had been urging her to take out an insurance policy on her life for quite a large amount, naming him as the main beneficiary, and it was discovered that she had made a will leaving everything to halt. It would be confirmed by a Bradford solicitor that a will had been prepared and signed by her. Holt was to receive her very expensive wedding ring and almost £5,000. Holt was arrested at 10.30pm on Christmas Eve, 13 hours after Kitty's body had been discovered. Evidence was gathered and a number of witnesses came forward, leading the police to discover that at around 10.30pm on the night of the crime, Holt had been seen in the vicinity of the Sandhills, which was about the time the murder was thought to have been committed. Additional incriminating evidence was found during a search of Holt's residence. His boots covered with sand were discovered. These boots matched the footprints found near Kathleen's body. Furthermore, Holt was known to own a pair of gloves that closely resembled the blood-stained gloves left at the crime scene by the perpetrator. Two young boys walking along the beach stumbled upon some unsettling evidence, a revolver commonly used as a service weapon in the British Army. Further investigation revealed that the revolver belonged to Holt. The discovery of Kathleen's will and life insurance policies left no doubt about his involvement. The police were convinced that he was the killer and believed that his motive for the crime was to secure his future financial stability with the money from the insurance policy and the will. It was also believed that the murder occurred soon after Kathleen had signed the said will. At the preliminary trial, Holt solicitor Mr Woosman tried to plant the seed of doubt when questioning Kathleen's husband, John Brakes, on the relationship he and Kathleen had had. But Brakes made it quite clear, with emotion in his words, that the separation between he and Kathleen had been mutual and they had remained on friendly terms. It was clear to those around that John Brakes showed more emotion than Holt had. In fact, Holt showed very little. At the trial, Holt was defended by Sir Edward Marshall Hall, who stated that Holt was insane, so was unfit to stand trial, claiming that the effects of the shell shock had caused him to act insanely, and his wounds had left him in great pain, causing deep depression, and that, in 1916, a medical board decided he was unfit to return to the front. Dr R. P. Smith, a former superintendent of Bethlehem Hospital in London, has examined Holt after his arrest and insisted he was insane. An extract from a letter Holt wrote to his solicitor while sat in Strangeways Prison was read out at court, where Holt claimed that the police had tried to kill him using mad dogs, germ carrying flies and gas. The prosecution rejected these claims by pointing out that no mention of his alleged insanity had been raised previously. Home office psychiatrists examined Holt and found him sane. The jury agreed and once established that he was sane he would face another trial. A new jury was sworn in and the trial began properly. Holt found himself facing an immense weight of evidence stacked against him. Despite the valiant efforts of his parents and sister in providing an alibi for him on the night of the murder, their attempts fell short when it came to confirming his whereabouts during crucial moments. As a result, the jury wasted no time in deliberating. 
swiftly reaching a unanimous verdict of guilt in less than an hour. The substantial body of proof brought forward by the prosecution proved to be compelling and overwhelmingly convincing, leaving little doubt in the minds of the jurors regarding Holt's culpability in the crime. He was sentenced to death for the shooting and stabbing of Kathleen Brake. Holt was hanged at Strangeway Prison in Manchester on April the 13th, 1920, without confessing to the crime he committed on the Sandy Hills of Lytham Beach. Thank you for watching.